Well, first off, I want to start off by saying thank you. Uh, the fact that everybody is here and we're engaging in this conversation, it really makes a difference, not just here at the BPA and the tandem program you guys have here. Uh, you're basically setting the example for all of Europe and all of the world, really, in taking time for a dedicated tandem instructor continuing education program. We've been doing this now. <coughs> this is our second annual day that we put together. Prior to that, we had invited uh, Jeff and Reg out to our UPT Tandem Examiner Standardization Meeting in uh, Germany back in 2015, I think it was. And that basically set the stage for what we're doing here today. The reason why I say thank you is that I have the opportunity to travel quite often. And when I do, I hear from a lot of different federations around the world that they see what you guys are doing here. They watch the videos, your BPA videos that you publish on your YouTube channel are seen around the world. And you guys are motivating and inspiring other federations to do the same thing. So now we have these types of meetings going on in South America, have them going on in Europe. And it's a direct result of the success that we've had here running these programs. So I take my hat off to you if I had one on. I thank you for that. Um, you're setting the standard for the rest of the world to follow. So thank you. What we're going to spend the afternoon on is talking about some different aspects of tandem skydiving. We're going to start off with some incident reviews. And then we're going to go through tandem exits. Then we're going to go from tandem exits. We're going to talk about hand cam and how hand cam is affecting our ability to do our job as a tandem instructor. From there, we're going to talk about tandem canopy flight. After tandem canopy flight, I'm going to show you some of the dumb things that we do in our sport, which is always entertaining. <clears throat> and then we'll wrap it up with some conclusions at the end of it. We're going to run from about, what's this, 1.30 or so till 4 with some breaks in between. And then once I conclude that part of the presentation, then I'm going to turn the room over to Bill Booth. Bill's here to talk to you guys about the history of tandem skydiving and a bunch of other exciting topics uh, that he's got to present from his first person perspective. So throughout this afternoon, I would encourage you guys to ask questions, engage, participate. I'm not here to tell you to do anything. I'm not here to say this is how things must be. I'm not here to tell you that these are the facts and they have to be this way. I'm only here to give you information to think about. If you leave this afternoon in this conversation with additional conversations amongst yourselves, evaluating the information, and discussing it, and most importantly, sharing it with those that aren't here today, that I will consider the afternoon a success. We're going to talk about some sensitive topics. There will be some conversations about incidents and fatalities. We're going to show some videos of some of the incidents that we have over the last couple of years. We're going to turn the cameras off when we do that. There's a couple of reasons for that, but primarily it's because we have to show a certain sense of um, understanding this is very sensitive information and it's not to be broadcast internationally on the internet. Um, when we're discussing incidents and what we can learn from them, that conversation is best had in person with the instructor examiners, the safety officers, and the people that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's how it's been done. It's how it's done now and how it's always going to be done in the future. So with that, <coughs> there's Derek Thomas, the first British skydiver I ever met. I've met a whole lot since then. This is my first BPA skydiver. It's pretty cool. We went up to Mount Everest together. Just a quick background on me. Uh, I've been a tandem program director since 2006. I've been tandem instructor since 2002. I'm currently the UPT Sigma tandem program director. I'm also a current uh, Sigma examiner. I train instructors once or twice a year as well when the time permits. And um, that's basically my quick background. The topics we're going to cover today, we're going to talk about emergency procedures in tandem. We're going to talk about the tandem incident review, how to improve our tandem exit techniques, talk about hand cam, the issues and the dangers, my favorite subject, the dumb things we do. We're going to talk a little bit more about tandem videographer, the role they play in our tandem experience. Then we're going to have our presentation on tandem canopy flight. Some of the more interesting things we're going to talk about later in the afternoon are the physiology of the tandem instructor and the psychology of the tandem instructor and how our physical body and our mind have an effect on our ability to handle and manage emergency situations and some of the things we've learned over time. We're going to talk about the tandem instructor shortage. Do you guys have a Groupon here or a Living Social, any of those volume uh, coupon websites? That's having quite an effect in the United States and we'll see what it's doing here. We're going to do a quick recap on pre-flights, which Kenneth had covered this morning. And then we'll 
finish with some positives, the good things we're seeing, and offer some conclusions. So that's how the afternoon's gonna go. We'll stop and we'll take uh, three or four breaks throughout the afternoon. These are kind of sectionalized. So as we finish a section, we'll stop, we'll take five minutes, we'll reset ourselves, and we'll come back and we'll do it again. So I grouped together emergency procedures and incident review. And the reason I did that is you can't have one without the other. You have to, in order to address incidents, we have to also start with the foundation of our incident, excuse me, of our emergency procedure knowledge and how that affects and plays into incidents and accidents. So <coughs> the truth is that today in the tandem world, we have a fundamental lack of emergency procedure knowledge and understanding. And there's a lot of reasons for that. There's no one specific root cause for it, but there's a number of reasons why, as tandem instructors, in general, we have this lack of full knowledge of understanding from A to Z of the overall emergency procedure criteria that we're responsible for to be able to handle on any given tandem jump. There's a couple of reasons for that. One, we have a culture today of relying on our RSLs and our skyhooks to finish our emergency procedures for us. Cutting away without deploying the reserve because we have an RSL, because we have a skyhook, or worse, because we have a hand cam. <laughs> Anybody ever seen any social media gold where someone has filmed their breakaway, whether it's on a sport rig or on a tandem system? It's 321 Facebook instead of 321 reserve. These sorts of perspectives, these thought processes, they're basically taking away the, the critical nature, the critical understanding of what it means to experience an emergency procedure. Our equipment is designed so well and incidents happen so infrequently that we're not called on or tasked to manage emergency procedure scenarios very often, so we tend not to take them very seriously. Just to help prove my point in terms of the volume of emergency procedures, how many tandem instructors here have gone over a thousand jumps without having an incident? Okay, anybody over 2,000 jumps? 3,000? Four? 5,000? Okay. 4,000 tandem jumps between, between uh, emergency, emergency procedure scenarios. On average, how many tandems do you do a year? 900,000, okay, so what's the math on that? How, once every four years? Imagine if you only had to know something, only had to call on a piece of information once every four years. Would you consider that to be a critical piece of information that you would have in your current consciousness every time you go on a tandem jump? We'd like to think we would, but subconsciously, jump after jump, year after year, the more successful jumps we make, the less critical we start to believe that the knowledge of emergency procedure knowledge really is because we're not being tasked to manage that process on a perpetual basis. Back in the early days of tandems, the malfunction rate was about one in 200. So if you were making tandem jumps in the same environment where it was one in 200, the math on that is what? Five, 20, you would have had 20 malfunctions in a four year period. So if you were to start your season off, you knew between now and the end of the year, you were gonna have four malfunctions. They were probably all gonna be chaotic and crazy because that's what tandem was like in the beginning, right Bill? So every time you jumped on an aircraft with a tandem rig, you expected the worst. So you had to have that knowledge ready for immediate recall. But that was then and this is now. Today, because the incident rate is so low and because we do such a high volume of tandem jumps, I believe is it Taupo that went 17,000 tandems between malfunctions or something crazy like that? Ocean no. City, Maryland. Ocean City, Maryland. 15,000 tandems oh. between malfunctions. 15,000 between two breakaways or two malfunctions. As a culture, how would a drop zone react to that if you're not being presented with malfunctions? 15,000 and counting. They haven't had well, one yet. 15,000 no, 15, 15, plus. Wow. So think about that as a professional tandem instructor, if you go to work every day, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, and haven't seen a malfunction, do you really think you're gonna expect one on your very next tandem jump? Probably not. And that's the baseline of the situation that we're in right now today, is that because the equipment malfunctions so infrequently, and because the success rate 
of the few malfunctions that we do have is so high that as a population, as a global population, we don't have the same focus and sense of urgency of knowledge base on our emergency procedures because we feel like it's not something that's going to affect us. It's never us. It's always the person beside us or someone in another drop zone, someone that we read about on dropzone.com or something. It's never us or the people around us. And it's that culture that has essentially degraded the critical nature of emergency procedure knowledge. It's absolutely critical. So from our perspective, what we've done in recognizing this, we now require all of our new instructors, if you were to take a UPT course tomorrow, when you graduate the course, you're signing a contract with us, and in that contract, you're saying, I agree to review my emergency procedures every 30 days. By reviewing these procedures every month, it keeps them current, and that's the most critical part of the emergency procedure knowledge base is immediate recall. The only way we can achieve immediate recall is if we continue to review the information time and time again. The other issue we're dealing with with emergency procedures is we're seeing more and more outlier scenarios. And by that, what I mean is it's not just tension knots. It's not just line overs. It's not just blowing out end cells that we can't land. Those are the kind of things that we would expect to happen. We're seeing things like videographer and tow malfunctions, where a videographer is hung up on the drogue bridle. Now, we showed that video last year. How many of you guys saw that video? OK. Um, we can show it again this year if you guys would like. I don't have it planned for this presentation, but if anybody would like to see that after we're done today, happy to show it to you guys so you can take a look at it again. Jeff's also going to have a copy of it as well to provide uh, your training courses and for your instructor continuing education classes. But when we talked about that last year, the question was, how comfortable would you feel handling a videographer in tow if you were presented with one on your next skydive? Now the good news is that most people got it correct. Most people had immediate recall of the basics of the process. But there was a little bit of polish that we did. There were certain things like we added the necessity to achieve horizontal separation after breaking away. Once we've freed ourselves from that main canopy, or from the drogue bridle, excuse me, coming down the right side, we then had to horizontally track for four to five seconds to get away from that vertical column of air. So we still had an opportunity to learn something as a group last year, making sure we ensured horizontal separation. That's just one example of an outlier. Another one might be a horseshoe malfunction. So I want you to take a moment, close your eyes, visualize it. If you were presented with a horseshoe malfunction on your very next tandem jump, would you be prepared to handle it? Just ask yourself the question, and we'll, I won't even ask you to answer it, just internal dialogue. Could I handle a horseshoe malfunction quickly, confidently, and most importantly, correctly? I could be quick and confident, but if I'm wrong, it doesn't do me any good. So if you can answer yes to all three, excellent. If not, now is the time to review that information while we're here safe on the ground, rather than up in the sky at 5,000 feet trying to figure out our emergency procedure tree. So as I mentioned the videographer, one of the things that we introduced in last year's conversation was it doesn't matter necessarily what we know. It also matters what the person flying with us knows as well. I could have all that information correct. I know the exact procedure for a videographer in tow. But if the brand new videographer behind me that gets hung up in my drogue panics and throws a pilot chute, what's going to happen? It's going to be a bad day for three people, right? Very bad day. So how many videographers at our drop zones are trained on this videographer in tow malfunction? Probably not many, because it's not something we think about on a daily basis. So I would encourage you, if you're taking notes or mental notes, when you go home to your home drop zones, quiz the videographers. Ask them if they understand the videographer in tow malfunction and what their role is in that malfunction. And if the answer is no, fix it. The other part of that, to take it even further in terms of outliers, have anybody ever had a friend or family member want to join a tandem? They brought a boyfriend or girlfriend for you to make a tandem jump with and they want to join you. Has that ever happened? You guys allow that here in Europe? Awesome. Do you brief them on that videographer in tow? Because they're just as likely, if not more likely, to get hung up in that drogue bridle because they're not used to flying with tandems. Should they know about that information? Absolutely. So these are just some of the outlier examples of things that we're not necessarily prepared for because they might only happen once in 10 years or longer. I can only think of two, maybe three videographer entanglements in 30 plus years. 
But I guarantee you, if you're one of those three people and you're in that entanglement traveling at 120 plus miles an hour towards the ground connected to two other people, you're going to want immediate recall of that information, confident and most importantly, correct. We want to make sure everybody in that, uh, that process has that same information, or at least the videographer or the swooper. So at the end of the day, when it comes to malfunctions, we always like to ask, would you bet your rating on it? You know, you ask someone, what's the malfunction for an uninflated drogan toe? They give you an answer back. Would you be willing to bet your rating on it? The answer should be yes. Because if you're not willing to bet your rating, truly what it means is are you betting your life? If you get the information wrong, you drastically increase the probability of a negative outcome, an incident or a fatality. So we really should have that level of confidence that every emergency procedure scenario that we're tasked with handling from one end of the spectrum to the other, we should have immediate, confident, and correct recall of all of them and be willing to bet our ratings on it on every jump. And if we're not, recognize that. Take a moment of pause, go back to the information, find the information, drill the information, and then and only then, when we are finally confident in that, all three areas, then proceed back up and make the next tandem jump. So what's the Spider-Man philosophy with great power comes great responsibility. I think it was actually Stan Lee that said that, not Spider-Man, but everybody knows Spider-Man. That's the term or phrase I use when looking at the emergency procedure tree for the Sigma tandem system. The Sigma tandem is the most technologically advanced tandem system on the planet. Bill's going to talk to you about all the cool things he did over the years to, to bring us to this point. But from my perspective as a trainer, what that's also done is it's also required that the mind of the tandem instructor be advanced and be complex and be proactive and understanding that there's a lot of things that can go wrong on a, any tandem skydive that require our knowledge base. We used to call it an emergency procedure tree because it would go out in one direction. This is more of a shrub. It goes out about as far laterally as it does vertically. There's a lot of different uh, directions and areas we can go with tandem malfunctions. And it's not just the equipment, it's also what we've learned in tandem. Over the last 34 years of tandem skydiving, we've learned a lot more about the things that can go wrong, about the, uh, the forces of nature, the relative wind, aircraft issues, all the things that can affect us beyond just the equipment, including that new thing called hand cam, which we'll talk about later. All these different things have created a much more robust, unfortunately, a robust emergency procedure tree. And it really is our responsibility to know every single one of them on every tandem jump we make because we never know which one we're going to be tasked to follow. And when we get to them, when we find ourselves in them, we want to make sure we're handling them correctly. It's the only, it's the only way to move forward. So that's my, ba my baseline on tandem incidents. Which brings us now to the tandem incident review, which is really the intent of this section. We've talked about emergency procedures, why they're so important, why knowledge and execution is so critical, proper execution is so critical. But now we can take a look at some of the incidents and accidents that we've been having. Before I start, I just want to offer to everyone that we're all skydivers, we're all human beings. Whenever there's an incident or an accident, it's human nature and skydiver nature to want to know immediately what happened. What happened? What was the problem? What can we learn from this? What's the effect of it? But it's not a readily available body of information most of the time we have incidents and accidents. For the most part, there really isn't a structure in place globally that would allow for any national federation, any manufacturer, any safety and training officer to be able to provide certain standardized information over a certain standardized time period. Every incident is unique and every location and every surrounding federation and investigation is unique. So there really is never going to be two standardized uh, processes where you're not going to see the same thing over and over again. But what we can take away from that though is that if there was an immediate need to correct something in any incident, this is beyond tandem, sport or tandem, if it was equipment related <laughs> or if it was training related, you would hear about it immediately through the national federations, through the manufacturers. So in the absence of that information, when there's incidents, when there's accidents, if there's not an immediate 
notification made across the, the platforms that we have, whether it's through our federations, through dropzone.com, or through Facebook channels, or whatever you want to use for your medium of dissemination of information, emails, phone calls, whatever it is. If you're not seeing that immediately after an accident, it is reasonable to assume that the incident or accident is a repeat of a prior incident or accident in some capacity or some form, and that a deviation of a standard procedure and or an emergency procedure was the result of it. And in that case, what's the best thing we can do to, to learn from that and to prevent that from happening to ourselves? Is to go back and review our standard procedures, review our emergency procedures. Are we exiting clean? Are we exiting stable, exiting into the relative wind? Are we doing our handles checks? Are we, are we knowledgeable and competent in all of our emergency procedures? And if you're doing that, then you're doing all the things you need to do to keep yourself safe. So that's basically the background conversation I just wanted to have on incident reviews. It's not something that manufacturers or federations regularly or typically just broadcast to the world as soon as they happen because there's a lot of factors involved. And the other part of this to understand as well is that if the day after an accident someone were to stand up on a platform and tell you all of the specifics, the people, problems, places where things have occurred, the next time there's an accident that individual organization might not be as prepared or as willing to share that information with us. So there is a certain sense of obligation to protect the privacy of the people that uh, are being uh, interviewed and worked with so that in the future there's an assurance that we will still have access to that information and still be able to uh, analyze these situations and from there learn from them and pass on the information. So that's what we're here for today is to go over that information with you. The, the information scrubbed of personal uh, information, scrubbed of location information, just talk about the things from what we understand based on the facts of what probably occurred in these situations. So the, the cornerstone of any discussion on in an incident or an accident, however, before we even talk about what may or may not have happened is that incidents are not accidents. We have to be very clear on that. An incident doesn't just happen. It's not just bad luck. An incident is always the logical conclusion of a series of illogical acts or decisions. You want to say that again, let it sink in. An incident is always a series of illogical acts, illogical acts or decisions that lead to only one inevitable outcome, and that is the incident. In aviation, I believe it's seven different things in aviation, five or seven different things. Anytime an aircraft accident is investigated, the investigators will come back with five, six, or seven different deviations, seven, five, six, seven different possible problems that occurred. And if any one of them are changed to the positive, any one of them are corrected, the incident doesn't occur. Skydiving is pretty much the same situation, the same scenario. It's never just one thing. There's always multiple factors that lead to incidents. And when we finally arrive at that critical mass, that moment where an incident is the only logical outcome, upon investigating it after the fact, if we go back, we start to see these identifying criteria that are leading us to that process or to that problem. And that's what we're going to look at now. So I also mentioned the criticalness of emergency procedures. Time is memory kryptonite. The reason why we have everyone reviewing procedures now every 30 days is because if we don't review it every 30 days, we will forget it. Some people would even argue that it's less than 30 days. It should be every week, every two weeks, every five days. We have a process called the retention curve. And what that retention curve means or states simply is that if you look at something, a body of information on day one, in our, in our perspective, emergency procedure criteria, if we don't look at it again after 30 days, our retention is about 10%. So imagine emergency procedures are there to save your life in an a, in a emergency scenario, and when it's time to recall that information, you only have 10% of your emergency procedure readily available to you in your brain. How would you feel about that? How would your students feel if you walked up to them and said, hi, my name's Tom, I only know 10% of my emergency procedures today, because <laughs> I haven't looked at my procedures in over 30 days. Are they going to want to go skydiving with me? If you guys got on an airplane to fly over to the U.S. to come visit us in the land, and the captain got on the aircraft and said, good morning, I'm Captain Tom. I only know 10% of my emergency procedures for this Boeing 757. I, don't, I forgot the aborted takeoff procedure. How many people would still be on that aircraft when that plane taxied to the runway? Zero, right? So 
That's why it's so important to continue to review this information over and over and over again. That retention curve states that you need to look at the information every five days. You need six information hits in 30 days, and even that only gives you about 90 to 95% of, of retention of the information. So that's just one example of why it is so important to continue to look at information over and over again. The other part is complacency. We go thousands and thousands of jumps without having to call on this information. Therefore, we think that it's not as necessary. We're not as worried about continuing to keep it in our current uh, thought process. There's also that philosophy, it can't happen to me. Bad things happen to you, not me. That's one of our philosophies in human nature. And then, of course, the incident rates are so low. Thank you, Bill. The incident rates are so low that we're going years without having malfunctions. We had someone at our last symposium, 10,000 tandem jumps without a malfunction. He averaged about 500 tandems a year. What's the math on that? One malfunction in two decades, and it was a tension knot, which he cut away. And admittedly, he said he didn't even pull the reserve. So how current is that person? They're highly experienced, but how current is that person on emergency procedures? Not very. Not very current at all. But we're going to use that and learn from that, that if it can be at any end of the spectrum, the beginning of our tandem career or 20,000 jumps in, we have to accept the fact that incident rates being so low are going to prevent us from being current on emergency procedures, and we have to make sure we make up for that by maintaining currency with the knowledge. So as I mentioned, we're not creating any new incidents. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. We're not creating any new incidents. Hopefully you guys are training your instructors to maintain visual awareness of their students even under canopy after the parachute's open, right? We're, we're watching where the hands go for our students. We should be training where our hands go on the students. It is not a coincidence that that instructor has a hand cam on. It's a great, it's a great shot and I appreciate having this educational tool. But it is not a coincidence that there is a hand cam. I block out the faces on the pictures because we're not here to point out individual people or the mistakes that they've made. If that blue dot was not there, where would the eyes be of that instructor? On the camera, not on what? The student. The loss of situational control. It's one of the many problems with hand cam. So <clears throat> incidents are always the logical result of illogical acts and decisions. And they fall typically within three primary areas. A failure of pre-flighting. Kenneth showed you guys all the flip-throughs that we went through. And we still continue to see. Failed standard procedures. And by standard procedures, I'm talking about exits. How to exit an aircraft with a tandem student attached to us is a skill set that defines you guys and girls <laughs> as skilled tandem instructors. We learn how to do it in our courses, and it almost would seem that as soon as we leave our courses, we forget most of what we were trained, because if we go back and look at some of the people that we work with year <laughs> after year, the exits that they're performing today are not the exits that they were trained on when they took their course. So failed standard procedures, rolling out of an aircraft, setting a drogue before getting stable as opposed to setting a drogue when? After we've got stable. That is a critical issue that has created more and more entanglements over the last three years than we had the last five years prior to that. Experience obviously isn't helping. We're seeing incidents at all experience levels, from 500 tandem jumps to 5,000 to 10,000 and so on. Being more experienced does not prevent you from being involved in an incident or an accident. This is my favorite. I've been told this numerous times. It's a sigma. It can't happen. Sigmas can't malfunction. Specifically, I was told that a sigma cannot have a horseshoe malfunction. Okay. Can someone just describe me what is a horseshoe malfunction, the basic of it? Hank? Yeah, the drogue is still in and the container opens up, starts partially opening. That can't happen, it's a sigma. Well, the locking pin can be popped out and you might accidentally well, start the drogue, the drogue attached. attached. <laughs> yeah. and the, the most yeah. common cause, and just to be clear, yes, a horseshoe can happen. The most common cause for it is failing to replace the main closing loop because you want to get one more jump out of it, you want to get one more weekend out of it, we'll, we'll change it Sunday night and it doesn't make it to Sunday night. If that main closing loop breaks, that massively complex system 
is now placed in a horseshoe malfunction. The drogue is still in its pocket, the main pack tray is open, and there's a very complex process to handle a horseshoe malfunction. It's difficult as a sport jumper to handle a horseshoe malfunction. It is even more difficult to handle one on a tandem because we have another body in front of us and our free fall speeds are accelerating very quickly. So I mentioned it earlier in this section, think about the horseshoe malfunction. If it were to happen to you, are you prepared to handle it? 